As entrepreneurs, we like to think uh, that we're in control. In fact, a lot of us got into our business because we wanted to be in control. And in fact, the word entrepreneur stands for, uh, actually means enter in and take control. And yet, are we really in control or is that control over our business illusionary? Uh, today, we're going to talk about one aspect that might, in fact, be an illusion, and that is control over our supply chain. Uh, during the pandemic, we know that supply chains were disrupted. Uh, we all had supply chain issues, even if it was just vendors who were not being able to deliver services to us because maybe we were um, essential services and they weren't or for some other reason, they were shut down. So we had massive supply chain uh, disruptions. And I think we kind of got this idea that, wow, maybe this idea of just in time, um, you know, inventory mm, actually has a downside to it. It's not just an upside to it. And today, fortunately, we are very fortunate to have Peter Goodman with us, who is an expert on supply chain, wrote a book called How the World Ran Out of Everything. Love the title. And uh, in, in today, we're going to talk with uh, Peter um, about what really happened. And then is there a way for us to have a little more control or is it, is, is, are we just, you know, completely at the mercy of, you know, what goes on globally? So, um, Peter, welcome to the show. And if you would give us a little of your background. Thanks so much for having me. So um, I am the global economics correspondent for the New York Times. I'm based in New York, uh, but I've lived around the world, spent six years in China uh, as the Shanghai bureau chief of the Washington Post, uh, covered the dot-com bubble in Washington for the Post, was the national economic correspondent for the Times, uh, and then based in London for the New York Times uh, until I moved back to the States about three years ago. So, I mean, I, I think I have a fairly international perspective and and I've I've been writing about the supply chain, usually as a sort of peripheral issue of other stuff, the Trump trade policy, the trade war between the U.S. and China. But supply chains have, have long been fairly close to the center of what I've been thinking about for several decades. So, so let's uh, get right into it. I mean, supply chain clearly... You know, we we blame first of all the Fed blamed the supply chain for inflation, and uh, which there certainly had some impact on it. And then we just know that supplies were completely disrupted um, during COVID. You suggest that the breakdowns weren't an accident; um, that there maybe was some intentionality to it. That's quite a statement. Yeah, it, not, not so much that the supply chain buckling is, is some sort of conspiracy. I mean, that, that would be a comic book. Uh, but we've got a lot of engineered scarcity in our system, which is to say, you know, uh, you got big companies. I mean, look at meatpacking, where, you know, four companies have 85% of the capacity to slaughter and process meat in the United States. I mean, that's a figure that would make the robber barons blush. So it's it's not an accident that when uh, supply gets some kind of shock, uh, in this case, the pandemic, uh, that the price goes up and those four meat packers make out like bandits and 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 celebrate record profits. Well, you know, at the same time, cattle ranchers are going out of business because there's a shortage of places where they can sell their animals. And, you know, those of us at the other end, uh, consumers, small businesses, grocery stores, you know, we're all paying record high prices for beef. Uh, and yet there are places where you can't even find beef. So, so I mean, that that's an example. It's not that uh, the pandemic is some sort of conspiracy from the meat packers, but they are set up so that when there's a disruption, they make money. Yeah. Can, can you kind of uh, break that down a little bit for us, Peter? Um, just kind of get into the, in, into the, the nitty gritty a little bit for us as to, okay, so what, what went on? Maybe take an example. Take the meat. Sure. Package. I mean, what went you, on you, that caused this? So you you have to go all the way back to the late 1970s and the Carter administration and the beginning of deregulation of really important industries like shipping, rail, and then of course uh, Reagan comes into office uh, with this mantra that you know government isn't the solution; it's the problem. And there's tremendous deregulation, lifting of antitrust enforcement. And that becomes the posture of every administration on both sides of the political aisle afterwards. This idea that uh, as long as consumer prices don't go up, 
in the immediate term that any merger is pro consumer. And in fact, Robert Bork, you know, who was a law professor right. before he was nominated later to be on the Supreme Court, law professor at the University of Chicago, actually came up with this consumer welfare doctrine as we shouldn't oppose any mergers as long as consumer prices don't go up immediately, which is really a misreading of American history. I mean, it, it, you don't need a PhD in economics to know that if, uh, one company swallows another company, and now there's less competition. Eventually, if that market concentration continues, guess what's going to happen? Prices are going to go up. Um, and it's, it's, it is not an accident that my book is full of examples of industries, shipping, uh, beef being you know the principal ones, where uh, shippers lose access to the reliability of a service there's delays you know a paint manufacturer discovers that if they're missing one uh component uh, uh of, of the recipe needed to make paint well they can't they can't make paint at the end of every chapter of my book somebody's making record profits who's got a monopoly hold on the market so there, well, there is let, engineered scarcity as a result well, of this let, let, let's let's take an example of that my my favorite example of that's amazon so, and, and that's because I sell, you know, one of the things I do is sell books, right? I mean, uh -huh. I actually uh, have a, a, a number one bestseller. And so Amazon, of course, is the biggest reseller of, of my book, Tax-Free Wealth. And uh, they get the lion's share of the profits for sure. And if something goes on, uh, if something goes on wrong with Amazon, it tends to be the business owner's fault, <laughs> not Amazon's fault. And yet when the, the profits are there, they tend to go to Amazon. So um, can you kind of walk through that? Because we actually have a, a number of listeners who are and viewers who are Amazon resellers. So, I mean, it's a huge marketplace, as you know. Um, a lot of our re, a lot of these are uh, resellers that they have their supplies, their manufacturing is done in China or somewhere else in Asia. And then they resell on Amazon. And Amazon has what I consider to be a very clear monopoly um, when it comes to reselling consumer goods. So well, the can Federal you kind of walk us through that? that? What's that? Yeah, the Federal Trade Commission agrees with you on that. Uh, yeah, actually, this verges into my last book, which is called Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devoured the World, where I tell the Amazon story in some detail because Jeff Bezos is one of the five primary characters of that book. Again, this is a perfect example of something that's not a conspiracy. It's just laid out there in broad daylight. Like this is a company that has built up enormous size, enormous data, um, and has used that data, has weaponized that data to force the companies that sell on its platform to accept the terms of its deal or basically get shut out right. of the marketplace. Uh, and and that that is that's certainly part of of the story of these. Uh, supply chain d disruptions. Um, I mean, there's another element too that's that's beyond monopoly power is that people running businesses badly uh, reacted to the economic impacts of the pandemic. And wh what do I mean by that? Well, once the shock hit, you know, stock markets recoil in horror, uh, quarantines happen, people are locked down, the unemployment rate in the US skyrockets, it goes up the less so, but in other countries as well. And, you know, mainstream economists and people running businesses said, okay, we've seen this movie, this is a classic economic downturn, there's going to be less demand for stuff for goods and services. Like if people are thrown out of work, Fewer paychecks means less demand. Less demand means we don't need as many container ships to carry goods around because lots of goods are made in China and sold in the United States. So uh, companies that buy computer chips, which is just about every company if you're in manufacturing, assumed, well, we don't need, need as many computer chips. They, they cut their orders. And the giant fabs that make computer chips, you know, this is not something you can turn on and off like a mm -hmm. light switch. Like it takes months uh, billions of dollars in terms of capital inputs. So the whole global economy basically got ready for a slowdown. And then what actually happened? Well, we weren't going to the office. So the sandwich place down the street uh, was out of business, but we were now stuck at home cooking, you know, 27 meals a day for cooped up kids. Uh, we weren't going to the office, but now our bedroom was an office. We needed, you know, a new monitor. We needed a, an office chair. We needed to entertain the kids with barbecues and trampolines and, you know, whatever else. So we ordered a ton of stuff, factory made stuff, 
a lot of it coming over from China. And that swamped our capacity to move goods around. And in part, getting back to this point of engineered scarcity, like the, the shipping carriers overdid it by setting aside uh, in dry dock some of their ships. They reduced capacity. And when it came time to bring that capacity back, they discovered it was actually pretty good to have scarcity because the cost of moving a 40-foot container from a factory in China uh, to the West Coast of the U.S., which is the gateway for 40% of imported goods reaching the U.S. by container, you know, went up from something like 2500 bucks to north of 25000 bucks in the space of a few months. And, and, you know, guess what? The shipping terminals are mostly controlled. You know, these are the parts of the ports that actually move cargo. They are controlled by the shipping carriers themselves. So they're discovering that they can say to customers, even with contracts, to get containers onto vessels in China, oh, sorry, yeah, we know you have a contract to move a box at, you know, 7000 8000 bucks. Oh, we don't have room on the ship. But if you pay a special handling charge, VIP service, expediting charge, you know, peak surcharge, peak season surcharge, they just come up with new names. Well, now there is space on that same ship. Ask yourself this. If you could go Wait, to the that airport. That sounds a lot like extortion to me. I mean, it, it it looked pretty crooked to a lot of people in the business, um, including people at the Federal Maritime Commission, you know, this body that most people never heard of, but that's suddenly tasked by Biden in the middle of the of the pandemic crisis with, you know, sorting this out and bringing the ocean carriers to heal. It, but, you know, really, like, ask yourself this, like, if you could go to the airport with a ticket to get from Phoenix to New York and the carrier could say to you, hey, uh, uh, we know that you got this ticket, but sorry, we don't have any sh space on the plane. But if you can pay 10 times as much, well, then suddenly we do. You know, what would happen? Well, there'd be congressional hearings immediately. And what if what if there was like a weather component to disrupting this? And it turned out that your airline was the one responsible for like cleaning off the tarmac to make planes move. How quickly do you think they would move to fix that problem? That's one of the structural realities that we've woken up to through these disruptions. It, it, it's crazy that the ocean carriers, the beneficiaries of higher rates, are the same ones running our terminals. That's well, mad. I'll give you another example. In the pharmaceutical industry, um, the independent pharmacies, they actually have to buy from the people who set the price. So, right. so, so, so the, their suppliers are the, turn out to be their competitors. Right. Yeah. So, so it kind of goes to a, a point that that you've made before um, is that this is not good for small business. That the, the, the big businesses, they're great because they have that power and that control. But the small businesses are pretty much left out in the cold. This supply chain is optimized every which way for giant companies who comprise the donor class in state houses and in Washington. And, you know, again, you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist. You could see this yeah. lying out there in broad daylight. I mean, it's very interesting. Uh, when I rode around uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach with a so-called Dre operator, these are the truck drivers who move containers from the ports to warehouses, in that case, in the Inland Empire in Southern California. And I remember I was with this guy, we are driving uh, somewhere on the port, and a safety inspector said, oh, whoops, there's a problem with your chassis. This is the, the contraption that's behind the truck where you drop the container. And he said, oh, we're, we're screwed, man, because if, if, if they find a, a problem that they can't fix quick, we could be here for hours waiting for another chassis. So why? Like, look over there. There's all these literally hundreds of chassis sitting there. He said, oh, no, 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 that's the Amazon pool. So Amazon has their dedicated chassis. Amazon could charter their own container vessels at the time when, you know, some 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 of your audience may remember 50, 60, 70 container ships just floating for right. weeks at a time off the ports of LA and Long Beach for the chance to load and unload because the, the docks were just overwhelmed. Well, Amazon, Walmart, Target, they could charter their own vessels and get dedicated service. And I, I remember talking to this very, or reading actually, an interview with a, um, uh, a shipping expert in Denmark who said, look, my advice to the big box retailers as they're paying higher shipping costs is ride it out because your competitor is drowning.
I mean, the, you're, 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 you're going to end up picking up share. Yeah. You'll take a momentary hit quarter to quarter for paying three times as much to move a shipping container as you're used to, but your competitors going out of business. Eventually the market's going to be yours. Well, this is a, uh... Does not sound positive for the small business. Um, I have two questions on this. The, the first one is, is it just a matter of money? Is it like you say, the donor class? Is that why this has happened? Um, because it does seem like the government, as general policy, favors large business to the detriment of small business. And then the second question I have is, after you answer that, is so, so what, do you, what do you do as a small business? Because it sounds to me like you're just, uh, you know, out of luck. Well, I wouldn't say that you're out of luck. I mean, I'll answer the second part first. I mean, it is time to think about place again, right? So if you've been running a business for the last, oh, half century, you've been invited every which way to uh, conclude that place doesn't really matter much. You know, container shipping is basically free and reliable, and a factory in Ohio is the same as a factory in southern China. Uh, as long as you got the internet, you got container shipping, uh, you got basic grasp of, of contracts, and you're thinking about intellectual property theft, then, you know, go ahead, use the global supply chain. Um, and that's worked out really well for lots of companies. Um, and by the way, my book doesn't argue that we should just abandon all that. There are all sorts of reasons why a lot of production moved to China and China is going to continue to be the center of the manufacturing landscape uh, for as long as we can see. But you got to have a backup plan. I mean, you, you again, you don't need to be a genius to have figured out that the US-China relationship is now full of volatility. Like whoever wins our presidential election in November, uh, U.S.-China trade animosity is likely to be a permanent feature. Trump put tariffs on uh, all sorts of imports from China. Biden continued them, advanced them in many cases. Trump is threatening. It's actually to, the one policy that uh, of Trump's that Biden continued and actually added to. Added to. That's right. Uh, and, and if Trump comes back, uh, he's talking about 60 percent across the board yeah. tariffs on all Chinese goods. So so everybody's got to be cognizant that they have to think about where their goods are made. And it's not enough to just say, OK, instead of making everything in China, we'll move some stuff to Vietnam. Guess what? Vietnam's also on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. And as we speak, uh, we've got the rebel Houthis in Yemen opening fire on right. vessels entering the Red Sea, this is a major pathway for goods from Asia to Europe and onto the East Coast of the U.S. And shipping prices are up about 400% in the last six months. I've talked to analysts who've said the actual cost to the shipping carriers of moving a container, they're now going the long way around Africa instead of the Suez wow. Canal. You know, that adds maybe 25, 30% to their cost. There's more diesel fuel that you have to burn. You have to pay crew for longer but 400% increase. So they've they've learned this playbook that when there's a shock, nobody knows what the components are in terms of their inputs. People will just pay, especially looking ahead to the holiday season, people will pay whatever they need to to get their products on, onto ship. So what can you do if you're a small business? You can think about uh, making stuff closer to your market. If that market's North America, you can think about Mexico, you can think about Central America, you can think about the Caribbean. While you're drawing on uh further away supply chains which is fine it's gonna be hard to, to compete with china think about india think about bangladesh uh th think about more than one place so if something goes wrong somewhere you still have a backup elsewhere and then it's probably a good idea to keep a little more inventory than you've been accustomed to that may cost you i mean mo most smaller businesses are, are not dealing with public markets so you know that's easier for a non-publicly right. traded company to do. I mean, publicly traded companies, you talk about extra inventory, more resilience, you know, Wall Street here's dilution of next quarter. If you're running a business for real and you don't just have to tap dance for Wall Street all the time, then, you know, you can act like a responsible homeowner. Well, who's well like, on, on, on top of that, we now have, um, since 2017, we now have a deduction for inventory when you buy it, when you're a small business. So you actually have that advantage. A lot of small businesses don't know that, but there is actually, you can deduct it when you buy it. You don't have to wait until you sell it to deduct it if you're under $25 oh, million threshold. So that actually was a really good 
actually part of the 2017 law that very few people are even hear about. So it sounds like having, and I agree, having more supplies on hand, that makes sense. Isn't that though one of the reasons for the tariffs is to actually bring, historically, that's one of been, one, been one of the arguments is to bring manufacturing back on shore. Do you think it will have that effect? Um, it will where there's subsidies, but that's not small companies for the most part, right? So, so we've got this big push to build uh, semiconductors in the U.S., right? Like the world has concluded that it's probably not a great idea to have the brains of modern manufacturing <laughs> almost exclusively made on a small island that's 90 miles off the coast of China, which not incidentally is threatening to use military force to take that island as part of its own. Uh, not a great idea. Uh, so, you know, the Biden administration is now unleashing tens of billions of dollars in subsidies to get companies like Taiwan Semiconductor to build plants in places like Phoenix, uh, Intel's building plants uh, in, in the states. You know, that'll happen. The subsidies for electric vehicles, that's generating some action as well. But, you know, for the most part, unless there's a subsidy, companies are going to still look for for low cost, reliable suppliers, which is where we get into Mexico. I mean, I mean, Mexico is an interesting case. Mexico cannot, by any stretch of the imagination, duplicate what what China has done, because uh, it's just not that big a country. Uh, and it's got its own problems. But it's got some some uh, offerings that are helpful as well. You know, I mean, you can get from virtually anywhere in Mexico to anywhere in the United States within two weeks. Um, and you got road and rail connections. You're not just at the mercy of this unregulated international shipping cartel. Um, and by the way, that helps you do just in time. I mean, to come back to your point about just in time, just in time was a very sensible idea that worked really well for Toyota at the end of the Second World War. Instead of just making as many cars as we possibly can at all times, a la Henry Ford, you know, it's Japan. It's the end of the Second World War. Their capital's limited. The it's a very mountainous country. There isn't that much developable land. So let's just make enough cars to replenish what we've sold. And let's get our suppliers to just bring us the parts we need on the assembly line and the numbers that we need them. Very efficient. Well, people have forgotten, and not by accident, but because consultancies like McKinsey invited the corporate ranks at publicly traded companies to forget uh, that Toyota had their suppliers clustered close to their factories. They were not in a situation where, oh, whoops, I have to wait eight weeks for some container ship to show up from China to bring me the one thing I need. Uh, well, if you move more of your production to places like Mexico, uh, you actually can go leaner with your inventory because if something bad happens, it's not that big a deal to go get more. Interesting. So, so um, let's say you're a small business. I mean, a true small business. I'm talking about you know under twenty five million dollars of sales. Sure. And and um, and and you all small businesses have some kind of supplier. I mean, for example, and we outsource. So so I have a among other things. Um, I have a CPA firm and my CPA firm, we outsource to the Philippines. So we actually yeah. have prepare, tax pre return preparers who are actually US CPAs preparing tax returns in the Philippines because it's less than half the cost to have them prepared in the Philippines. Okay. So, but we all have that. And there's all some, always going to be some kind of supply chain issue. In our case, it may just be the internet. Could just be sure. Zoom. Right. I mean, that's still part of the supply chain. Sure. So so how do you minimize the disruption other than location? OK, how do you minimize that disruption um, when it seems like the big guys in the government have so much control over it? Well, I'm not sure that the big guys in the government have as much control as we think. I mean, I think there's some some element of these pandemic era disruptions that are reminiscent of like the realization after the financial crisis of 2008 that lots of stuff so complicated the people who built it don't understand i mean you know we wrote all these mortgage contracts and run up to the housing crisis that were designed to never be acted on because the whole financial industry was marinated in this idea that you know we could never have national housing prices go down i mean similarly we've flown pretty close to the sun with just in time uh, pretending, and, then, and now I'm mostly critiquing publicly traded companies, uh, pretending that, you know, nothing bad will ever happen because even though we knew that was a fantasy, uh, nobody wanted to be the CEO saying, you know, hold on, we need to build another factory. We need to stash more 
uh, parts in the warehouse as a hedge against trouble, you know, that guy lost their job. Yeah. Um, and, and the guy who said, you know, let's just pare it down to the bones, you know, yeah, trouble will happen eventually, but it's not going to be next quarter, probably by the time, you know, the pandemic happens or, you know, the Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2012, which was really disastrous for supply chains, that guy's cashed his options and is, you know, it's lying in a hammock on some beautiful beach with a cocktail on his hands. I mean, the, the, the problem is the short term, uh, thinking and, and, uh, and, and, and so, you know, it's it's not like the government could just you know ma- wave a magic wand and make this go away. Risk is part of reality. I mean, mm-hmm. we that that's that we have insurance, right? Like, if you're a homeowner, you don't really know what's going to happen. You know, something's going to happen eventually, or you might just have to replace your roof or whatever. Like, life is risk, and so it is with the supply chain. I mean, my book is not a, a cry for the fantasy that we should have a foolproof supply chain. There's no such thing. Rather. We need some more resilience. We, we, I mean, we should be able to conclude that it's a pretty bad idea to depend upon a single country, a country that not incidentally we've decided to have a trade war with, to give us basic medicines, ventilators, you know, face masks in the middle of a public health catastrophe. We should have more resilience than that. And that's government action goes into some of that. Some of that just goes into sensible people running businesses in intelligent ways. So... Let's talk about something that we don't have a lot of control over, but what I'm hearing is a lot of, let's be a little more, have a little more foresight, be a little more strategic and maybe have some insurance there. Right. One of those things that that we saw really big during the uh, pandemic was panic buying toilet paper. Um, And there are certain things that are, and toilet paper is the funniest one because the COVID had nothing to do with, Toilet paper it literally did not make you go to the bathroom more. So it's right. not like it caused diarrhea. So, right. and yet we had a panic because the one thing we do not want to be living without is toilet paper, right? Sure. So, so how do you actually forecast that into your model if you're trying to be strategic? Well, um, there's an interesting guy who I talked to from my book, Willie She, professor at Harvard Business School, who's an expert on the nitty gritty of the supply chain. Who thinks that part of the problem is we got carried away with so-called skews, you know, like too too many different product offerings, so it became too complex for uh, for for retailers to keep themselves stocked with all the stuff. And once they started to run out of some, that sent a signal to consumers that there were shortages, and then everybody said, "Oh boy, I don't know how often I'm going to be able to go to the store." Uh, with everyone walking around with masks and every human being I encounter is potentially going to kill me and my whole family. I better grab everything I need. And yes, you're right. There was a lot of psychology in that. Um, and I, I mean, the only that's going to happen. I mean, there, there's no question. But I mean, if the sense takes hold that our supply chain is less vulnerable than we know it to be, then you know, similarly with the psychology of a bank run, you know, if 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 we all know that finance is is uh, swimming naked uh, and nobody's really watching to see that there are reserves put up against uh, liabilities, uh, then that bank run's going to happen quicker. And it's not like all of us were experts in supply chains, but we could see what we could see at the store level. Oh, uh, there's no meat in the display case. I wonder what they're going to run out of next. Okay, what do I need the most? And and so the more resilient the supply chain is, the more guarded we'll be. Uh, but, you know, some of this stuff is going to happen. Well, it's uh, it's it's fascinating. I mean, that we could go for hours on uh, on supply chain. We all felt the effects of it. But at, I, I'm going to kind of bring this down to, again, as the small business owner, um, yeah. if you could just give us two or three practical things that you think any small business owner could fairly easily do to, to protect themselves. I mean, you're talking about insurance and I think insurance is the right word. What, what, what can you do? I mean, I think that supply chains have been really unsexy for a long time. Right. So like most people, they think about engineering, innovation, marketing, like the stuff that gets business people excited. Right. And, 
Uh, 10 years ago, no, nobody walked around saying, let me tell you about my business. Boy, we got this incredibly innovative way to manage our, you know, incoming <laughs> supply, right? Like the, the, that was the guy you would edge away from at the mixer. Well, if you're running a business, you need to have a good handle on what are the things I can't live without? Uh, what are the inputs uh, that are, you know, th that are capable of shutting me down if I don't have them? And who am I depending on exactly? Uh, and it's worth calling up your supplier to say, I want to hear about your backup plan. Uh, where are you making your stuff? I mean, uh, th this this may sound like a, a strange way to speak to the small business owner, but it's but you know Walmart knows a thing or two about supply chain right. vulnerability, and they know something about globalization. Well, fifteen years ago, if you flew down to Bentonville, Arkansas, to get your product on the shelf of a Walmart superstore, they would ask you where are you making your product, and if the answer was something other than China, you had a problem because the assumption was. You know, you're not getting the cheapest price. You're not making it most efficiently at scale. Well, now if you go down to Bentonville and they ask you that question, you say only China, you have a problem. They want to know what is your backup plan. And if you're running a small business, you should be quizzing your suppliers similarly and looking to spread your business around so that, you know, you don't discover like, you know, I got a guy in my book who, uh, who sells, um, uh, restaurant uniforms out of um, a home uh, embroidery shop in Dallas, you know, and he thought he was dealing with this local company uh, that was bringing, that would sell him, you know, the blank cotton uniforms and then he'd do the embroidery. Well, it turns out that company's dependent upon the Asian supply chain. So unbeknownst to him, this warehouse in Dallas he's transacting with is entirely dependent upon stuff coming in from China and Vietnam. So at the worst of the pandemic, they can't get any inventory. Well, that's something that business owners ought to know about in advance uh, now. Uh, and we ought to be thinking harder about uh, inventory. Uh, we ought to be trying to limit our exposure to international shipping because that game is really rigged uh, for the biggest uh, businesses. And it's going to be tough to move everything back to the United States. That's a nice political fantasy. Sounds good. Looks good on a bumper sticker. It's going to be hard to do in practice, but you can look to this hemisphere. And by the way, you can feel good about it because, you know, it turns out that when we buy finished goods from Mexico, roughly 30% of the value of those goods is made in the United States by American workers. And the, and the, the similar number for China, by the way, is 3%. And Chinese state policy is directed at dropping that number as close to zero as possible. So taking advantage of the regional supply chain is a way to give yourself a little more resilience. And then in terms of um, employees, you know, I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that Henry Ford, a problematic character, but he knew something about making products at scale, uh, doubled his workers' wages in 1914. And some people said, what are you, crazy? Are you a communist? You know, what, what are you doing this for? He said, because I need to know that I've got people who are coming here to work without worrying about their financial problems at home, who aren't just constantly looking for the next job. And he specifically said, any business that's premised on low-wage labor is inherently unstable. Now, that's, that's harder advice for a publicly traded company to take, but a small business owner knows that there's a real value to having motivated employees who feel like they they're getting a fair piece of the action. So that that that's a significant component of this. What 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 do you what do you think? Um, how do you think technology plays a role in in this? Because certainly there are things that technology might be able to do so that sure. we wouldn't need to rely on the supply chain. I, I mean, I think we're always going to need to rely on the supply chain, but I think technology is at the center of better forecasting. Uh, AI will certainly be helpful in terms of showing us where, the, you know, how the pathways work. Because what we discovered in these most recent supply chains is even big companies don't really understand the extent to which like one component is coming from, uh, you know, a place unexpected. I, I remember talking to the CEO of a uh, of a medical device manufacturer in San Diego 
who really until the pandemic didn't fully understand the semiconductor supply chain, didn't realize that he was last in line, you know, like, like once we ran out of computer chips, guess who got theirs first, Google, Apple, yeah. I mean, the car companies thought, you know, car companies generally act like they're the center of the universe. They didn't matter very much. They, That's right. they, they don't buy at volume like Google and Apple. So they couldn't get their own stuff. Uh, and meanwhile, here's this guy who's making machines that help people with sleep apnea go to sleep knowing they can safely take their next breath. He's begging his suppliers for more. And they're telling him, well, actually, five layers down in our supply chain, we can't get a company in Australia that applies a chemical treatment to one component that eventually turns into another component that turns into the chip that we buy from our vendor. We can't make that happen. I mean, talk about not being in control. Uh, so, so now is the time for these hard, so I'm sorry, you asked about technology. Uh, so AI certainly could be helpful in terms of exposing where we're especially vulnerable. Uh, automation certainly helps us get out from under places where, you know, we're depending upon workers who are doing tough, dangerous jobs, uh, who are going to look for other jobs when, when they have, have the chance, uh, and and soft, there's all sorts of software solutions to give more transparency to the supply chain so that people can't anticipate right. problems. Oh, oh, um, for sure. And and actually, that's where blockchain would come into play, right? Because then you you ought to be able to know you ought to be able to know where it is at every every level. But what I'm hearing you say is one one of the things that you can do is simplify your supply chain. So I, I hear a lot of complexity in you know Australia and all these different complexities from different places in the world. But to simplify it and more localize it seems to me like that might make a lot of sense. Yeah, and in some cases it's about more complexity, right? Like if you got one vendor, maybe you should have two vendors. That's going to be more complex. But if you do it right, you're now less exposed to a problem in any particular place. I mean, just look at the situation today, right? So we talked about the Houthis opening fire on ships blocking the Red Sea. The Panama Canal has suffered tremendous drought. They're limiting the number of ships going through there. We had the Baltimore Bridge collapse that shut down the port of Baltimore for a while. As we speak, there's the threat of a rail strike in Canada. Dock workers on the East Coast of the United States are mobilizing for, for potential strike. I mean, there's going to be stuff that's going to pop up. It's kind of whack-a-mole. And the idea that we're going to build a system that's just impervious to any of these shocks is it's crazy. I mean, that's before we even talk about climate change. Um, so some more complexity in places is healthy if it gives us more resilience. So, and, and so really re review that, what your supply chain is, some, right. some re redundancy can be important sure. at the same time, maybe reducing the number of inputs um, can also be a good thing because then then you don't have to worry about is one little part, is one little piece of the process going to block my entire supply chain? So you've got an exponential issue there. So the book is uh, How the World Ran Out of Everything. Uh, Peter Goodman is our guest. Uh, thank you, Peter. For thank you. Um, This has been fascinating fascinating information. And this is the type of thing we need to understand as entrepreneurs. Um, and this is the reason we do the Wealth Ability Show is so that you can get some practical guidance on, okay, so what do I do about my supply chain, whether I'm a service business or a technology business, or I'm a manufacturing business or a retail business, whatever it is, we all have supply chains. And we know that if we can do make it a few little strategic tweaks, whether it's um, some some redundancy in suppliers, whether it's reducing the number of inputs that go into our product from the the different places, whether it's localizing, um, you know where where our supply where our supplies come from, whatever that is, those are strategic moves we can do now, and when we do that, we're always going to make way more money and pay way less tax. We'll see everyone next time. This podcast is a presentation of Rich Dad Media Network.